from the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. Welcome to today's uh, North Idaho College Public Forum. Over the years, we keep looking at different subjects that we wish to address on this public forum, and one of those that we have not discussed in a long time is the issue of the quality of water in America. And Of course, this program being in the Northwest, we will emphasize here in North Idaho the issue of water quality. As many of you know that the Congress of the United States passed what was called the Safe Drinking Water Act, and from that, the federal government and states and localities have a responsibility to monitor and to address water issues. And certainly water is a, a, a life source that we as human beings cannot do without. We're going to do a two-week series on this important subject, and we're going to try to break the programs uh, into some organized way of looking at that issue. And on the first program today, we're going to talk about the overall general view of water quality and how we uh, address that question, how we measure it, and we're going to look at here in North Idaho the, the precious lakes we have and the water systems and, and talk about their condition. In order to do that and then come back with you next week when we'll deal with such uh, questions as aquifers and how they supply such an important part of, of our life system of water, uh, we will bring uh, two other guests both today and next week our guests come to us from the uh, state of Idaho uh, Department of Environmental Quality, often called the DEQ uh, division of our government. And I'm very pleased to welcome to our program two highly qualified individuals to discuss uh, this part one. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome Roger Tinky, who is the t has the title of Prevention and Certification Supervisor at DEQ. Roger, we've met and you've been most gracious with your time and welcome to the program. Thank you. And I'm equally pleased to welcome to the program Ed Tullick, who is Monitoring uh, Division Supervisor at EQ here in North Idaho. And Ed, I've watched your work a long time and know that you're uh, very experienced in this process. And uh, again, welcome to the program. Thanks. Roger, I will start with you. And oftentimes it's very helpful to our viewers to talk a little bit about structure and organization. If you could kind of take us through uh, the Division of Environmental Quality, and I know that they deal with uh, other things other than water issues, but if, if you just kind of define that for us and that role in state government, how that relates to the national government to get us started. Right. Well, the DEQ in Idaho is, uh, uh, comes from the Department of Health and Welfare, and uh, we're the Division of Environmental Quality, and we handle the uh, water issues as well as uh, solid waste and uh, air pollution and uh, hazardous materials. And, uh, of course, here in our office, as we're talking about water quality, um, we're uh, looking primarily at the lakes and the streams. And uh, I also handle programs that deal with uh, compliance monitoring from the uh, wastewater treatment plants. So uh, we kind of do a, uh, a broad scope. We, we like to uh, make sure we know what the trends in the general water quality are as well as uh, looking at activities that might impact that water quality. Now, you have painted a very broad brush, which the Division of Environmental Quality has to do. Of course, environmental quality does deal with air, and it deals with water, and, and waste, and uh, hazardous waste, and all those kind of things. But we have confined ourselves to one of those units. Based upon that, of the division here that's, that's housed in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, about what percentage of the time and staff is taken up on this, just this one area of water quality? Oh, um, I would say it's probably, uh, I'd have to put it at 75 percent probably. So it would be the number one function that uh, you, as a division, would be responsible for? Yes, yes. Uh, Ed, we'd like to talk a little bit about uh, some definitions again for our viewers. We, it's like teaching a class that you walk through process and steps. When we discuss this federal legislation that's in place, obviously they had some ideas in mind of what quality water would be. Uh, on that general premise, both with federal legislation and, and state policies and all, how does one define water quality? And, and uh, there'll be another series of questions, and one of them will be, how do we monitor that 
uh, quality? Well, first of all, there a, a lot of, of what we do uh, is based upon federal and state mandates that, that have uh, set a goal of restoring or maintaining um, water quality throughout the United States. And um, the role, uh, most of the standards have, have uh, been derived much from much research uh, that set very specific standards uh, for various chemical pollutants. And um, our goal is basically to work along those lines to uh, make sure that, uh, that those standards are achieved. And in dealing with those, let's go a little bit into more depth with the guidelines that, that you're responsible for administering. I, I guess the best way to proceed with that would be to ask the question, um, what are the pollutants that really damages water? Can you just kind of take us through and some of the more dangerous ones and, and, and the ones that are found most often in deterioration of water around the United States or even other countries? Well, in our area here specifically, we uh, have um, sediment and nutrients. Uh, sediment, of course, is something that can interfere with fishery and, and drinking water supplies, which are beneficial uses. Um, uh, we have um, uh, nutrients that, that cause accelerated aging of lakes and make them basically unfit for, uh, for uh, drinking water as well as recreational activities. And we have toxic pollutants, uh, heavy metals, uh, some other chemicals that uh, are dangerous for people to, to drink. Um, those are the, the broad categories that, that uh, most of our uh, efforts are centered around to try to, to make sure that, that uh, those levels or water quality standards for specific pollutants aren't exceeded. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that damage can be very great if it uh, enters the streams and the lakes. I, I guess you brought a point to mind to ask a question, and that is when those pollutants enters let us say a river versus a lake, of course from the river they can come on into the lake, do they do more damage to one or the other over a quicker period of time when I'm thinking of where its water is moving versus where it's more steady? Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, pollutants discharged into a uh, stream are, uh, with time, they're, they're carried uh, to a, a lower elevation, generally a, a reservoir or a lake where uh, the, the um, uh, effects uh, of the pollutant can be much greater. Um, usually uh, the lakes around here we have a much lower flushing rate and then, then obviously we do with a, a stream type situation and uh, the consequences of the pollutants can be much greater in those kind of situations than in, in the rivers. Uh, although we do have situations, uh, the Coeur d'Alene Basin of course, that, that um, uh, although things have gotten better there, we still have some very high concentrations of heavy metals that, that do affect uh, the fisheries that, that are there in, in those streams. Those emissions that came in during the height of the mining uh, years and so forth, of course, those were coming in rather rapidly now that that's uh, not happening. You're, you're still saying that they are sediments that gradually wash from those rivers still into the lake. That's correct. There's still uh, a significant amount of, of waste that was uh, deposited historically uh, all along the, the river basin and uh, as high flow comes every year it gradually flushes more down into uh, uh, lower areas and thus uh, some of our strategies for cleanup are to immobilize or to uh, reduce the possibility of some of those uh, deposits from getting into uh, the water course. We're trying to make sure that happens. Later in this very program, we're going to talk some about what we do and what are some of the solutions. When I was talking with you prior to this program the other day, I was very impressed, too, with letting our viewers know something about uh, the popular lakes of North Idaho. And what I'd like for you to do is two things now, if you don't mind. One was to identify for the viewers, I believe you have three basic categories of how you label the condition of each lake. Do that first, and then we're going to come back and talk about specific lakes and what categories they would enter. Okay, uh, the the uh, we have the the groupings as you indicated, and they are uh, primarily very pristine bodies of water, since such as um, Priest Lake, Ponderé Lake, and and Hayden Lake. Um, the the those are as I say very high quality. The other end of the spectrum is uh, lakes such as Kokolala. 
uh, Hauser Lake and the Coeur d'Alene chain lakes like um, uh, Rose Lake, Killarney Lake, um, Cave Lake that are, uh, the uses are being affected there because of the metals primarily. Uh, in the middle of that are, area, are lakes such as Spirit and, and uh, Twin Lakes that uh, uh, are, they're not pristine and yet they're not uh, very extremely productive like the, the lower range of them. Uh, this is all based upon monitoring that we have done and university uh, studies have shown uh, to, to put them into those categories. And Lake Coeur d'Alene, which is the really large one that's used most often by uh, tourists and, and local citizens too. Is it in, in the worst condition of all the lakes as far because of the uh, emissions that were for such a long historical period? You know, Coeur d'Alene, and I, I missed that one, uh, it would be in the, the medium range. Oh, it would there. be in the medium. Right. It's, uh, Coeur d'Alene has different facets to it. From the lower end, it can be classified as a very uh, productive, the Chad Collette Lake uh, region, to the middle part is more of a middle range. And the upper area near Coeur d'Alene here is is much higher quality, so it's it's got different uh, different aspects. But overall, it would fit into that medium range. Mm -hmm. that, that's really interesting to use. With that, I'd like to come back uh, to you, Roger, if I can. Uh, and, and again, we're going to get into some specific solutions later. But when we were talking, there have been funds available over time, and I assume some of those are state and some are federal, <coughs> and now where you're concentrating, I believe, in the area of loans to deal with planning, would you, would you define the difference between that kind of funding and, and, and funding for uh, construction and, and solution to? Sure. Yeah, the, uh, the grant program was, has been around quite a while, since the early 70s, and uh, the goal of that originally was to see that uh, all the wastewater treatment plants would meet a certain quality in their effluent. That was considered secondary treatment at the time. That was a technology-based effluent limit they talked about. Whereas now, we're, um, lately, we've been tending to look at uh, what quality does that effluent from the treatment plants need to be in order to protect the water quality that it's going into. And um, in order to do that, we've been, um, the uh, traditional grant program that in the past paid up as much as uh, 90 percent, actually 94 percent for some innovative processes, uh, 94 percent grants, and uh, now it's been phased out into a loan program. Now, when, when you had the grants at 94 percent, that was okay. the, whoever was going to do this at the local level would get 94 percent of all the, the money that would be needed from? That's, that's correct. So they only had to come up with 6 percent okay. local match. And uh, uh, when that grant program was that way, we we uh, effectively upgraded most of the facilities in the area. And, uh, but there still remains, as, as I said, now that we're looking at uh, what does the effluent quality have to be to avoid impacting the receiving water, um, we're going back and finding that we have to upgrade some of these treatment plants. And uh, also, uh, another use of this loan assistance program is for uh, collector, system, collector lines to get out and to pick up the uh, outlying areas of the communities. And um, right now, uh, the assistance program that we administer, um, we use a, uh, a grant, a 55 percent grant from the state water pollution control account to pay for a study that identifies the most cost-effective alternative for either an upgrade or uh, sewer in a community. And uh, then once we have the study or the engineering report completed, <coughs> uh, we come in with the loan uh, program that's also the source of that loan money is from the federal government. So it's, a, uh, it's still a federal program that the state of Idaho DEQ administers. Uh, by a delegation agreement that EPA's worked out with the state of Idaho. So, uh, and uh, since it's a loan, um, the idea of that program was that uh, uh, the federal government wanted to put in enough money over uh, about six years that we could get those loans made 
and then as they are paid back, it's, it's called a revolving loan program. So we'll have a sustaining loan program that we can continue to uh, either provide upgrades or continue to meet the collection needs of this area. When those loans are issued, is there an interest involved or, or just pay the principal back? Yeah, it's a low interest loan and, it, and um, um, interestingly enough, the, uh, uh, right now it's at 4.5% for a 20 year payback. And uh, we compared that to uh, our old grant program and when the communities were going out and, uh, uh, well, a real common grant was 25% local match. And when they were required to go out and borrow even 25% of the project cost at prevailing interest rates, that, you know, which might have been 7.5 to 8% back then, you compare that to getting a loan for 4.5% and uh, <laughs> the way the economics work out, it, it uh, oftentimes it, it's equivalent in when you balance all the economics to receiving about a 50% loan or a grant, excuse me. Yes. Now when, when those loans are issued to a local entity and they do a study and from that study they find out their problems or their needs, if they go to correct those or in, to apply that study to construction, then they're on their own to do that. Is that correct? The funds are not available for uh, the construction itself? Uh, no, they are. I, maybe I didn't make that clear, okay. but um, the program does provide a grant to do the study and then a loan to do the design and construction. Okay, that's that's where I was confused. Yes. With that in mind, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, this whole question of some of the solutions and, and in specifics, and I'll return to you, Ed, and talk about that. I, I guess, first of all, we need to identify what are some of the most serious problems, and I would assume they would be the most expensive to address. So let's let's do that and then we'll talk about how do you go about increasing the quality of, of the water once you find that. You did mention a minute ago about the different kinds of sediments and so forth, but I don't think we've made it clear to the viewers the level of uh, seriousness or toxic uh, aspects of some emissions more so than others. Well, that, that's right, Tony, because of the fact that uh, particularly in the Coeur d'Alene Basin where we're dealing with some uh, some uh, heavy metals that, that are known to be toxic in, in some forms, um, uh, primarily lead um, uh, is the one we're, we're concerned about from a human health standpoint. Uh, it does take a lot of, um, um, a, a lot of, of thought in terms of, of how best to, to solve the problem. Um, uh, some of the solutions we're looking at, uh, as I indicated, were more of, of actual removal where it's, where it's possible in the headwaters of, of the Coeur d'Alene Basin. Uh, that, that is something that is uh, fairly expensive to do, uh, but it's not nearly as expensive as actually removing waste from uh, Coeur d'Alene Lake itself if, if that were, were feasible. Um, the Can we get a little more specific? At the at the headwaters and so forth, when you go to remove, uh, what kind of operation are you talking about? Basically, are you removing it from the actual bed itself and then also on the shore? Or? You're, what you're trying to do there is remove it away from the water course uh, such that you don't have uh, continued erosion from high water flow from the adjacent tributary. Um, you also want to cap it so you can uh, preclude rainfall precipitation from, from percolating down through it and further liberating uh, toxic metals. Um, you, um, uh, if you revegetate it, of course, you're, you're putting a soil cap on top of it and, and uh, further uh, removing the, the source from any uh, potential pathway to the, either the surface water or groundwater. Um, there are some technologies uh, that, that we've seen a little bit about as far as reprocessing, but uh, they seem to be very expensive right now, although I think we're, you know, we're still interested in, in seeing uh, what kinds of, of, um, of uh, possibilities are out there. We've always got to remain open on, on uh, ways of, of you know, reprocessing and removing it completely from the system. Once you remove that, do you have a problem with where you're going to store it? 
Yes, obviously. Keep it out of other water systems or right. groundwater. That's exactly what we don't want to do is, is uh, obviously remove it and take it somewhere where it's going to cause another problem. And uh, uh, so a lot of um, uh, thought has to go into just exactly how to, how to stabilize it. And we're, we're doing some things right now that are, are uh, new ideas, uh, but um, we're, we're trying to act upon the information we have available right now and experiment. Uh, at the same time, we're, we're doing some monitoring to make sure that, that what we're actually doing out there is not further aggravating the problem uh, and, in, and, in fact, solving the problem. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit more on some of the new uh, experiments that you're engaging, other than what you've already talked about? DEQ uh, ourselves uh, are not actually doing the, uh, any uh, new experimentation. Um, reprocessing is the only one I'm, I'm familiar with, with right, right now. Uh, but I understand there are other evolving technologies that, that are being examined. Um, I guess we have to keep in mind here the extent or uh, the amount of, of waste that's been deposited historically, I think the figures are somewhere around uh, over 100 million uh, metric tons that have been deposited since the late 1800s. And, uh, in, course that in that one system. That's, that's from, from the headwaters all the way down into to Coeur d'Alene Lake. So uh, we're dealing with a problem of an enormous magnitude. Um, um, you know, it's, it's just a matter of, of deciding in specific areas, what, what is the best uh, approach for isolating or if, if reprocessing does ever come about, um, you know, utilize, deciding where that needs to be, um, uh, where it's most feasible. When you talk about reprocessing, what are you particularly addressing? You're basically going back through the material and taking the toxic metals mm -hmm. out of it. It's, there's different processes that can be, can be utilized, giving the, the uh, type of pollutant involved, but you're basically taking the, the uh, materials out of, out of a form that they would be readily available to get back into a water course. Mm -hmm. Something else that I found interesting about the whole issue of water quality for lakes, and uh, Roger, I'll come back to you, I think, and if, if I've got the inappropriate person address this, you can indicate, but I have heard some discussion of Coeur d'Alene Lake being uh, probably the most prime example because of the headwaters of bringing the, the minerals into that lake, but, but other lakes, and not only here but around the United States, there are similar types of problems and emissions of different kinds of minerals into lakes, and then of course the emissions of chemicals, and some of those I think would be probably more difficult to, in the sense that you don't see them deposited in the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, one of those, those questions that I've heard raised is that once those minerals have been deposited on the floor of the lake for a long period of time, and if you go in and try to, in a, in a large lake like Coeur d'Alene, you try to remove that, that you stir up that whole process and you may do more damage. How is the technology addressing that question? Can you take those sediments out of lakes? I can see Ed just ready to jump on that question. Because that's really more Ed's <laughs> yeah. area. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, it, it is, as I indicated, from a stand, the, just a practical standpoint of the extent of, of deposition along the lake bottom. <clears throat> it would, it's, a, it's a very tall order. Um, it, it is, uh, I, I think, that uh, the management plan that's being prepared right now by DEQ and uh, the USGS and the Coeur d'Alene tribe uh, is more than likely going to look at management of the situation that it, the way it is right now in terms of trying to reduce the amount of nutrients coming into the system, recognizing that we've got heavy metals on the, in the sediments of the lake itself that there really isn't a good way to take them out of there. Um, we want to we uh, minimize the, um, the dissolution of heavy metals from the bottom there, the way we can do that is by reducing the amount of nutrients that come into the lake itself. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's more of a management type of a solution, we think. Right now it's still in a very uh, draft stage in terms of the management plan, uh, but we certainly think that, that uh, that's probably the, the option for a Coeur d'Alene lake itself. Uh, that coupled with the, uh, the removal or remediation of the upstream metal sources to keep further metals from coming down into the, the lake itself uh, is probably going to be the, the more, most realistic solution there. So I hear you saying that the, the, not only that lake but other lakes that have certain kinds of damages, that it's not maybe feasible to 
bring them back to their original state of, of pure quality? No, uh, no. On a smaller lake, of course, um, it's it's much easier in terms of um, uh, you have a much smaller area to, to deal with. Given the uh, you know, if you have a metals problem, if, if that's what you're you're talking about, uh, and certainly that's that's uh, much much easier to address. It's it's easier, but it's uh, it's still very expensive when you get into to dredging costs and uh, any kind of a chemical treatment. Uh, the Research basically shows that if you, you're, you're much better off to re remove or reduce the amount of pollutants coming into a water body rather than wait until later and try to restore them. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some basic lake restoration costs on um, lakes around the area, Medical Lake and um, Newman Lake, where there's actual in-lake treatment going on and it's, it's very expensive in the form of several hundred thousand dollars for initial capital outlay in some cases. Um, and then uh, a, a distinct maintenance cost uh, that, that goes along with it. So it's better to keep pollutants out of the stream rather in, or out of a lake rather than allow them to get in there and, and uh, have to try to remove them later. I've read some reports and even had some guests on this program that have visited the former Soviet Union and something that you don't have to address is the uh, dispersing of uh, nuclear waste into the rivers and lakes in the Soviet Union from nuclear power plants and so forth when they didn't have any regulation concerning their pollutants. And the testimony I got is that some of the rivers and lakes have been destroyed, they're dead. They, the radiation, of course, will, will go on for centuries. But when you're not dealing with that kind of problem, and, and I heard a figure that 15% of the water systems of the Soviet Union had already been destroyed with, with a much lesser problem. Uh, my question to uh, you would be, to one of you, would be, is it possible, dealing with other kinds of waste and not nuclear waste, that a lake still could die and, and could not be restored? Certainly, all all lakes um, all lakes are in an aging process where they'll ultimately uh, get shallower and more productive and, and then die, become basically a bog and a, and a wetlands. Um, it's always a question we get into with lake studies is to determine what the objectives are for that body of water. I've got to interrupt. We're out of time. I want to thank both of you gentlemen. I wish we had time to pursue this further because there are other things we'd talk about. And with, with you, uh, Roger, we could talk about uh, ways of, of uh, trying to help people prevent those. Uh, but the good news is we're back with two other guests from your division next week when we'll continue to talk about water quality. Until then, ladies and gentlemen, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of Telemedia Services on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station. <laughs>